Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Valley Sports Rewind. I'm Mike Kenichi, and I am honored today. We have with us, he's been the head coach of the Shelton Girls Soccer Program for 12 years now. Before that, he was the girls soccer coach at Derby for 10, and he runs a great youth soccer program in the Valley. And we are delighted to have Mr. Marvin Miller. And uh, Coach, honored to have you on today. Thank you for coming on. Well, I'm flattered that you asked me. I'm glad to be here. So, Coach, let me ask you this. If I remember correctly, you grew up in Colorado, correct? Right. I was raised out west, Colorado, Arizona, California, most of them. Right. My childhood. And if I'm not mistaken, you really didn't have a soccer background when you were a kid, correct? You were a football player? Oh, yeah. Much. It was all football, baseball when I was a kid. Um, but I, you know, my family was pretty blue collars, and we lived in um, some of the working class neighborhoods. And in those communities, it was mostly Mexican American. And, uh, so soccer was kind of like the neighborhood game. Right. And, uh, all the dads in the neighborhood kicked the ball around and the kids kicked the ball around. So we were around the game, but we didn't have a lot of formal leagues or structure. None of right. that really existed outside a little league and football when I was a kid. Right. So you really didn't have an interest for it as a kid back then? Well, I love to play the game. I just right. was always fascinated with the game. And, you know, we'd watch the, uh, go over to some of my friends' houses and their parents would have videos or, uh, of games or right. you know, some of the Spanish league games or the Mexican league games in particular. Um, right. And um, <clears throat> it was always great because I just thought it was a tremendously amazed me how these people could do these things with their feet you know and that right. was and so when we started playing the ball when we were kids um in the neighborhood you know that was just couldn't wait but my senior year in high school they finally started a boys soccer program right and a bunch of us jumped ship off the football team to go over and play so oh was, so you didn't play football senior year or? um not really no 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 so let me ask you how was <clears throat> compare sports out in Colorado, the sports in the Valley, I mean, you've been around both. What's the difference and what are the similarities? Well, I mean, of course, you know, the sports I played out there when I was in the late 60s and early 70s, and <clears throat> it was, we, teens were a lot different then than they are today. And I think that's one of the big changes in the sports is because in those days, you know, everything was top down. Right. The coaches drove everything down. The, Players listened, learned. And, and again, I don't have any issues with that. I think players still do that today. But I think players today are more willing to want to know why, um, to try to understand motivations and intent. And, and I right. think that changes all the sports to some degree. Um, I, um, you know, I watched the, the Shelton football coach, and I, when I was at Derby, I watched the Derby football coaches. Right. They're both, those guys are still pretty old school. They, uh, they still, you know, have a firm hand on their teams, and right. and, they, and the athlete, and there's a lot of respect between the athletes. I think that the interchange between coaches and players is a lot more right. mature today than perhaps it was. I don't know if mature is the right word, but it, it, you know, I certainly didn't relate and talk to my coach the way my players talk to me, and I like the way my players and I interchange today. Right, um, and I probably would have liked it better if I had had that when I was a kid. Right, um, and of course it was just you know. It was a lot of old school drill mentality. You know, right. There was not a lot of talk about nutrition and hydration. I mean, it was there, but it, the science behind it all was right. far more. Whatever your coach said made was right, and that was how we looked at things. So, right. So let me ask you: How did you find your way to Connecticut? What year would you, were you like <clears throat> out of college by then? I mean, how, well, how would you? And I, um, I didn't have a real great start in college, and uh, because of that, I needed to kind of take a time out from college when I was a young guy, and uh, and I got into the service. I went into the military. Right. Those days, we were in the in the the Vietnam War, and the draft was still going on, and uh, I decided rather than wait for being drafted, you know, that I would uh, enlist and try to prove my options. And I went into the service, my family, into the Navy. My family is a Navy family, and has always right. been, and. Uh, so the first time it came to Connecticut was simply because they moved me out here because I went into the submarine service and I ended up going to sub school up in Groton. Right. And uh, I actually played soccer for the sub base up there on the oh, sub base wow. team. You okay. know, that, you know, the military had a lot of stuff going on with teams and organizations everywhere I went. Every base had a team or there were leagues in the area. So I, you know, I, I stayed in the game uh, that way after high school. And, uh, and then, um, you know, 
I got out of the service, moved around, followed my career, and just coincidentally, I ended up working for General Electric. Right. That went took me. I started in Kentucky, and then they promoted me to a position back in Connecticut. Oh wow! And that's how I got back here, and that was like 1990. So. Oh, so you've been here almost 30 right, years. Right. Right. You know, for my kids, this is their home. They were all uh, only one of them was born in Connecticut, but. Um, all of them, I think, believe Connecticut is their home because they've been right. here since they're children, very small children. So Right. So now let me ask you, obviously you've done a lot with the youth soccer, but when did you start to get involved with coaching soccer? Oh, that? yeah, that would be back when I was uh, still playing. I was a, um, played on a rising men's amateur team. Um, it was, uh, I was playing around college. I, was, I played, uh, I walked onto my college when I went in, it, I played a little bit at, uh, in college in Maryland. Um, and then, but by then my career was kind of driving my life too, because I was going, right. I'd gone back to school after I went to work. I went out to Colorado and uh, come, worked out there and uh, played locally for a men's club there. Um, right. And uh, they were always pretty, pretty high level clubs. Uh, some of the players, you know, were semi pro ex pros or semi pros and uh and then when I went to Kentucky I ended up playing on a team. Um that was guy recruited me on to just met him in a park. Right. And um it was a pretty good team and we started playing together and I played there for a couple of years and then I got pretty vocal about things on how right. we should be playing and stuff and we weren't going much of anywhere and so then the guys just turned to me one day and said, Listen, you know, why don't we have a change in leadership? Why don't you take over? And um, I, I think I created my first coaching rule, which was with adult men, which was, okay, if you don't come to practice, you can't play. Because right. that's always a thing with adults. And uh, that was the first team I coached with these adult guys that I was a player coach on. And uh, it was kind of an interesting experience. And uh, right. I kind of liked it. And so when I came, uh, moved up here to Connecticut, um, and my kids first started getting into soccer. Um, right. Like they had any choice, but then we were pretty, <laughs> we were pretty committed as a, fi- a lifestyle to soccer. My wife always said that, you know, that's where you can find her every Saturday afternoon or Sunday after morning was uh, sitting on a soccer sideline with all the other wives and girlfriends. Right. But anyway, we um, started coaching with my kids when they were little, and it just kind of evolved out of that. Right. So let me ask you this, though. Obviously, you like I've mentioned a couple times, you run a great youth soccer program. And I believe you started running that as early as 1993. Correct? Oh, yeah, pretty early. Um, there was a actually, I have to give props to uh, John Francisi, uh, right. one of the old soccer uh, fellas, icons here in the valley and in, um, in Shelton. Um, he. I was coaching some travel teams for the Shelton Youth Soccer Program at that time. That's where my children were playing. And right. uh, John was coached some boys' teams, and uh, he also was doing this little thing over at the club. Right. And one day he asked me to come over and uh, see what, what it was about, and I did. And I started working around with him a little bit, helping him out around there. Right. And, um, uh, and then I think right around that time they had the big fire. And uh, right. we all ended up over on down underneath the, the bridge. The bridge, right. Yeah. And we still found the way to patch that together. And John just kind of decided that, you know, he was interested in the club team. That with, At that time, there were some of the clubs traveled. It was an interesting con, but all the, the, the boys' clubs had like a little travel league amongst themselves. And, right. And uh, John was pretty responsible for that, getting that all working from the Shelton end. He did a great job with that. And... Uh, I know he brought some of the Shelton soccer players into that. Um, and then he kind of just gave it to me. He just, you know, I said, take this, you know, and uh, do what you want with this and see what you can do. And I don't know, we started conceiving the idea, Jim Queen and myself, and uh, right. in those days we're talking about a, a winter indoor soccer league. And so the first thing we did was we, we just tried like an open league, just like the boys club does for all their other sports programs. And poo, we had a couple hundred kids sign up. and right. And I think we're going to be in our 25th year this year. So wow. it's pretty, yeah, it's, it got, you were saying to me earlier about how things go fast. Yeah. And when you look back, time, it doesn't seem like 25 years, but you right. know, when you're in the middle of February and Thursday night at nine o'clock, it seems right. sometimes it's, <laughs> and you've been fighting snow, it's, uh, 
but it's a great league and it's you know the the club people are just absolutely wonderful right and um i love every bit of that program i really do and that program has really grown i mean it's like you know everybody who plays soccer plays in that league i mean it seems like i mean because it if I'm not mistaken, it's age five to like 18, correct? Right, right. We run, right. Uh, and in fact, last year we started a new academy division. We call it the academy division, which is four and five year olds. Uh, they don't play any like league games or anything, but we bring in, um, I like to, to find people who are willing to give back in the program. And so I really try to recruit the, um, the soccer players, the teenagers who are working in the various soccer programs in the clubs right. and play for the schools and have them come work with the, the younger kids in particular. I think it, the younger kids are like seeing those 15 and 16 year old boys and girls right. you know, when they're four and five, because they see themselves in 10 years, you know, and, and I think, and I think the kids, the older kids generally enjoy giving it back to the little guys um, because they were there once themselves and there's, and, and, there's, right. there's all, and, and they always get along really well and, we don't have any, you know, any problems. Uh, the kids and the and the coaches. There's, you know, sometimes we have to worry about that. This is a boys' club league, and I always try to remind ourselves. You know, it's a rec. We like to win. The kids want to win games, but it's a recreational program, right. and the having fun should be the number one. So many of these kids get serious soccer the rest of the year. Right. This is a place I want them to go and have some fun, and so I think the youth coaches bring that back to the program, and we've been doing that for probably five or six, seven years now. Right. And every year, more and more, we get more and more youth coaches involved. The younger they are, I'd like to have those teams running that program as much as I can. Right. And the other thing is, too, not only do you uh, run the league, but you always make it a point to coach one team each year in the league. So is that just you, you want to stay fresh coaching or you enjoy coaching, you just want to take a team? Or Well, I think it's both. I think sometimes, you know, obviously I tend to coach the older teams, um, simply because that's sometimes where we need coaches. Right. Uh, so it's sometimes just to fill the void. Um, but, you know, I love the league, and I love working with the kids. You know, I love right. working, especially I get a chance to work with kids I don't normally see the rest of the year. You know, uh, our club teams are always a, a mixture of kids from across the valley. We don't have a Shelton team or an Ansonia team, and we form these teams. There is, you know, kids from any of the towns in the valley right. are likely to be on that team. And so it's kind of an interesting puzzle because you have to mix differing players right. with differing skill levels and experience, differing soccer styles. And, and you only get them, you know, a few 15, 16 sessions across the winter. And, and so it's, um, it, it's, it's very challenging in that respect. And it's a really rewarding. The kids are great. Right. You know, what I really love that, what I love about that league more than anything is in the high school division, on any given night, when you have a game going on, you look in the stands and there'll be 25 to 30 kids, sometimes 40 or 50 kids from the other teams in the league Staying. who aren't even playing that night. They're coming to watch the games. Right. You no. know, because they're all friends with each other. Right. And, you know, they play against each other in the club, but then they all play for, with each other outside in other at their outdoor clubs and in their schools and it's just really it's one of the best things about that program right and there's nothing better than watch a kid who starts at six who leaves the program at 18 and has been there for 12 years i call right. those kids my lifers you know <laughs> and there's always a handful of lifers every year that you know right they always oh man i really don't want to go so and then they come back and coach some of them as some well. of them do some yeah. of them do and and that's always great you know i have uh dad's coaching in some of my intermediate divisions that at one time were players in this league. So wow. that's, that's very cool. Yeah. That's neat. So let me ask you this. Um, I know the Derby soccer program began in 96, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they were playing games, but I think it was kind of started or was well, it started before that? I was, I'd been coaching in Shelton and had been asked by the, but I lived in Derby. Um, right. My kids were playing in the travel levels in Shelton, and Derby didn't offer travel soccer in those days. But the Derby people reached out and asked me to come over and talk to them about starting a travel program, and <clears throat> so we did. And um, I could tell that for my own children that, that having the opportunity to play with their school friends was a big deal for them. Um, right. So we started up, and then it, it just the natural. We started up at a U14 girls team, and I think the year or later, maybe two years later. Derby Youth Soccer started a boys team. 
Um, right. And two years after that, we started producing players who were going to be going into high school, and they had no place to play. And so the soccer advocates in town went to the Board of Ed, and, and I believe it was 96. I want to say 94, but I think you're right. Maybe it was 96. Um, and we started a uh, – I was – Brought in, interviewed, and asked to uh, start the, the girls' soccer program. Right. And it was really weird because, like, two years later, the boys' soccer program started. Right. So, and that was, you know, I think the first coach there was Bill Harris, who was another guy coming out of the uh, youth soccer program in right. Derby. And uh, so we started that program over there. And uh, you know, I'd never done anything like that before, start up a, a, a brand-new program. And, and, uh, and that was an interesting challenge. But I also learned a lot about myself as a coach. Right. And um, working with those athletes who uh, at that level. And it was, right. uh, you know, that was the education I think I needed to become a better coach. So Right. Now, how many years was it before you played a varsity schedule? Because I believe, was <clears throat> we, it? We only, we played a varsity schedule I th- se- our second year. Second year. Our second year. Right. We played a JV schedule our first year. Um, and that same year, I believe East Haven High School started up a program. Right. So we played East Haven a few, you know, that was like our... Big game. Well, it was our rival because we were like both the same at the right. same level. And uh, it was kind of the way we measured ourselves in terms of our progress is who could beat who over those first couple of two, three years when we played East Haven. Right. Um, because at that time, it was really tough to walk in and play Guilford or, you know, or uh, right. Cheshire or uh, Shelton or somebody. Because we started in the old Hoosie League. Right. The very end of that. And then, of course, the SCC came about right within the first year or two after I got when it started. So Right. And let me ask you this. I mean, you're a, a new program, and you're playing against a lot of programs who have had established soccer programs. How difficult was it your first few years of coaching? Because I'm sure you didn't get a lot of W's at the time. So how difficult was that for you as a coach? Well, one of the things – that I think lies at the core of my coaching philosophy today is when I try to make my athletes understand if your only measure of your success as a player is in the amount of playing minutes you get, if the only measure we have as ourselves as a program is by the number of wins we get, then we're going to be pretty vat. Everyone's going to be disappointed. Right. Because, you know, only a few teams get to the win level that they – they hope to get to every year, um, you know, and uh, most players have to, you know, get share playing minutes with other players. And so in those early days, that was the thing I learned was how to make the player see success in other ways, about levels of improvement, right. levels of competitiveness, um, ability to uh, accomplish things with the ball that they couldn't do six months before. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we had some wins along the way. Um, and, I mean, not a lot. But I am, you know, it was tough because just girls' soccer in Derby in that time, just getting right. momentum behind it was tough. Um, even in our travel teams, um, just we didn't have the numbers, and so we often our teams had a few players right. from other communities that 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 filled out our roster. Um, and what really helped us is that uh, because we kind of were an open thought club about that, that allowed us to. Um, start collaborating with some of the other soccer clubs, and Sonia and Shelton in, in particular helped with right. us in the early days. And I know we sent players back that went on and played for Shelton High in those days, and we sent players back to Ansonia that went on and played for Ansonia High. Right. And um, and meanwhile, we just kept trying to build that nucleus of soccer players in Derby that would try to get that thing so it would catch its own fire and and roll out there. And um, but it was a struggle. And you know, you could look at them today, and there's you know, it's it's a it's a difficult sport only because it's a number sport, you know, right. It, you have to have some, some numbers to, to develop the pool of talent over the years when they're younger. And, uh, right. And I, of course, you know, Derby faces that challenge in a lot of sports simply because it's a small school and I'm, I'm always amazed. I will say this, the Derby athletes that played for me in the 12 years I was there, um, were always a team that brought pride and spirit, right. and they never, ever thought of themselves as not being able to win. They come out every game 
you know, that goes deep down in that Derby sports core. Right. And uh, that, you know, I think when I first came here, I learned, I always saw that. My kids were raised up around it. And um, so I was really, ha- you know, never had a team. We went, you know, it's a couple of years we didn't win a game. Right. But those kids, you know, they gave me as, as much of themselves as they could. And, you know, that, in the end, that's all a coach can ask for. And right. Expect. So. You know, it's good to see them get better as the season goes on and maybe the wins aren't always there but you see different things they're playing better as a team they're getting better but as a coach you know you, you know you'd be kidding yourself if you said you know the losing doesn't hurt sometimes so let me ask you how difficult was it like say maybe year six or seven where you're seeing the program expand a little bit but you're still not seeing as the wins like you like how frustrating is that did you take it home a lot with you or well, I don't think I took it home, but you know, there were times when I was asking myself, <clears throat> you, know, you, know, you ask this question, you think, well, I'm a better coach than my results are showing. And you know, there's that little bit of personal pride that comes into that, that you'd like to right. have the opportunity to really see. Um, uh, what I learned how to do at Derby was do a lot with the little, manage the resources wisely, <clears throat> we played a one year a whole varsity season with 15 players right and and somehow you know a couple of games we barely dressed 11 because of injury and or illness and uh and we got pretty creative and uh we were able to and that was huge learning stuff for me i mean the you know i learned so much about things about running a program because of the unique things that happened at Derby High. And, right. <clears throat> and I'll be honest with you, it helped an awful lot having uh, Charlie DeCenzo around most of that time as my principal right. and Kenny Marcuccio as my AD. Two um, great guys. Yeah. Just, you know, it's like anything else. You know, they're all football guys. That's what I got told when I got hired into the job. Right. <clears throat> 100% of the time. Those guys stood behind that girls' soccer program. Anytime we needed something, they did whatever they could to bend over to make that happen for us because it was important to them that this program be successful too. And right. even today, even though they don't have a lot of wins over there, I've left Derby now, been gone a dozen years, and the program's still there. Right. It's quarter century over there. And um, they may not even have 25 wins in that quarter century, but there's something there. And... Uh, you know, I think that says a lot about the, the athletes in Derby and the <clears throat> and the attitude about how people are in the school system. And right, but it was it, it's frustrating, and I mean, you can't take it to the kids, and you can't take it back to the the people who hire you. I mean, right, um, and ultimately, I you know, I think that probably was a big motivator for me to look to to another opportunity. I just felt that that I needed to show to myself that I could accomplish some things as a coach. Right. That I just wasn't going to be able to accomplish at Derby simply because we didn't have the, the tools we needed to. Right. And I don't hold down. It's not about anybody being blaming anybody because that's not the issue. It's just it's just the situation the way it was. Right. You know, it's like the, the, you know, the guy starts off at junior college and grows up, goes yeah. somewhere else. And yeah. that's kind of why I looked at my move from Derby to Shelton was kind of like that. Right. So you stepped down as head coach at Derby after the 2005 season. The Shelton job becomes available. And now, you know, the unique thing is you go from a class S school to a double L school. So now, you know, it's no more about there's definitely going to be numbers there because with Shelton especially, kids are always playing sports there. Their track program is huge. Their cross country program is huge. Their soccer program, their football, basketball, you name it. It's such a big school that every sport gets the numbers so let me ask you this how did that job come about and what what was it like you know going to practice that year i mean well actually i the job had come open the year before and i'd interviewed for the position um i had some people from shelton youth soccer who reached out and i knew was aware of the job and i was already thinking about it right i had created in my mind these what i thought the dream high school positions, you know, if I was ever going to be at another high school, which one would they be? And I had this short list, and Shelton was right on the top of that list. Right. Because I had that long relationship with Shelton Youth Soccer with my own children and coaching right. in the club, and I knew the Shelton people, and I knew the soccer community. It's a very positive, healthy community, and they full of people who are trying to do the right thing to make the sport grow. Right. Even then and now. Um, so the... 
but I didn't get the position. Uh, they gave it to a fellow who had better credentials and I think had done more success. Um, but it didn't work out with him, I guess, because the next year it was open again. Right. <clears throat> and I think the Shelton people really took a position of adv advocacy for me uh, with the uh, with the high school folks, with the athletic director and the house headmaster and the board of ed, whoever they had to talk to. Uh, and I interviewed and <clears throat> was given the job. And it was like the first time you walk out there, you, you know, it's, it's like winning the lotto, you know, in right. terms of, of soccer. Because I went from, you know, 17, 18, 19 athletes, and now I've got 45 and right. 50 in front of me. And, like, within a year... Or maybe just even my first, I think within a year, we had a freshman program, too, on top of the varsity and the junior varsity. Our right. numbers were that big. Which and, is uh, important. I, yeah. I had a staff, you know. I had, right. I had a junior varsity coach, and I had a freshman coach, and, uh, and a varsity assistant coach, and uh, people to work with. And, uh, and I got to, to the opportunity to, to build that and develop that staff and find people that would, you know, that, that right. complemented my coaching abilities that made up for some of my shortcomings where they, wherever they are. And, uh, and it was just, it was really wonderful. And, um, right. And, you know, people always tell me, you know, people are back there. So well, you're the fourth coach in four years. And, uh, and I just made my mind up that I was not going to be one and done, right, right? A one and done coach. And, uh, I was lucky. I walked in, uh, and I had uh, two fine captains that had been selected the year before. Um, one of them was just, you know, one of the best captains that's ever in the 25, four years I've coached, probably stands in my top five or six. Right. Um, and that made that transition so much easier for me uh, personally. Um, and I just think they were needed, you know, I'm a very structured fellow. I'm kind of very organized, and right. I, you know, have I, I'm about objectives and plans, and making plans to achieve objectives, and and I, I think I brought that in, and they needed that, and um, right. And then we had a great first season. The season before, they'd only won like four games, and our first year out, we won eight games and made states. Right, and that and had to be a good feeling for you because after you know so many years of disappointment you finally get in the playoffs. That had to be like, number one, you had to be relieved too as a first year coach. Right. It was, you know, to make States, I never made States at Derby, never won eight games in a season at Derby. Um, so yeah, for me personally, these are big achievements. Um, but more importantly, I think it was a big achievement for the, the, the players because right. uh, they hadn't had that in a while. Right. And uh, they'd had some talented players that had come through there that had just not been able to achieve, I think, success as a team at the level they they thought they that they should have achieved um so winning the eight games was great and right. uh and you know in the first year i'll be honest with you it was a honeymoon i mean the 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 the, the families were glad i was there the, right. the soccer program i think you know certainly I really felt um uh, that my athletic director john niski was glad i was there right uh, the headmaster was very supportive i mean i used to turn around the headmaster be sitting behind the bench at the games you know it just right it was great stuff, and uh, and you're right. There's a big spirit. I mean, a spirit that's equal certainly to the spirit we saw at Derby, uh, and just you know made better by all the numbers and being able to run and do things in practices that we couldn't do before and that we right. couldn't do in the past. And so it was really great. You know, it was like, like I said, it's like felt like winning the lotto. Right. So let me ask you. I got to believe, and we're going to get to the 2010 team in a second, but I got to believe after making the tournament that first year, you had a goal within three or four years, let's win a state championship. It was something that I don't think they ever won one till you guys did, correct? I could be wrong. Right. We uh, Our state championship win in uh, 2010 was the first uh, girls' state championship at Shelton High in, I believe, 25 years. Right. That's what I think the girls' basketball program Right, with Howie Gurra, yeah. Right, yeah. 25 years before. And, and Mr. Niski told me that. I, it's, I, I didn't even know that until it happened. And right. He, he told me a couple of days later. And, wow, I just, you know, that, that was, wow. I didn't, didn't even right. cross my mind that uh, that was why it was so big to them. Uh, right. And it was a big thing to us. And we did. We... Somewhere in the, the second season, 
I started seeing a trajectory that if we could get on this trajectory that we could certainly become competitive with the best double L programs in the state. Right. Uh, I had this good working relationship with the youth soccer program in town. Um, we were kind of all on the same page in terms of, of uh, they're promoting their athletes and developing their athletes to get them as ready as they could for us and uh, at high school. And uh, so it just, we, we saw the possibility there. So we started putting the plans together and setting standards right. of, of, you know, standards about that we expected the athletes to meet in terms of fitness and uh, technical skill and, and, uh, we broke some of the traditions that had been there. I mean, in, you know, I think, I think we traditionally, the pro, you know, was very senior dominated all the time and been history, which you've seen a lot of sports and we, but in soccer, I mean, you know, talent is talent. Right. And if it comes in at 14 and it's a varsity quality, that's where it needs to be. And uh, we started making philosophical changes to put us on that path. And every year, 2009, 10, you know, I mean, uh, seven, eight, nine. Right. We um, kept getting better and better, and we're getting closer and closer to that. <clears throat> My 2009 team was a very good team. Right. Yeah. And that was uh, led by some great uh, seniors. Several of them went off to play college ball, um, and that team got close. Right. You know, it got close, and uh, and I thought, wow, you know, and my juniors on that team. And my sophomores who had made that right. score on that nine or nine team, I think they really felt it, and there was a yeah. big commitment coming into that 2010 season that we were going to do what we had to do to reach levels of, of performance that we had never achieved as a program. And it was really you felt that among the athletes from the first day, they really was a strong commitment to coming and fit that year. Um, and we, we were lucky; we have uh, programs that run around us, you know, through the communities to the um, community programs, right. uh, parks and rec, summer conditioning programs and stuff. And our athletes bought into all that stuff and started, you know, right. we're big fans of it. You know, we encourage our players to participate, and uh, they do. And by 2010, that was really becoming a standard of what athletes expected to do to get ready at Shelton. And then everything just kind of fell together right for us in 2010. Right. And, you know, the funny thing about um, the 2010 season is, it would be your fifth year. And a lot of times coaches have a habit of giving it five years. And if they haven't put the program to where they want, they leave. So now you're in year number five. So this is like the five year plan. And not only do you win the double L, but you also win the SCC that year. So talk to me, number one, I mean, I'm sure the state was always in the back of your mind, but talk to me about winning the SCC that year, because you're playing a tough schedule week in and week out. And that had to be you know, a tremendous <clears throat> feeling. Well, we were in the old Housatonic division of the SCC then, and we were, um, which, which means we stood in a division with Sheehan right. and Cheshire and Amity, um, all very good schools. Right. And we have some really deep-seated rivalries with, at Shelton with Cheshire and Amity. Right. Um, I, great guys. We, we respect each other, but, man, we love to beat each other. You know? Right. And... Um, we hadn't had much luck with those programs. And uh, so we really set out that goal is let's just try to win the division. Let's right. beat Cheshire and Amity. You know, let's go for that. And, you know, we went away pretty, went away pretty well. We uh, started off pretty strong. You know, um, we rolled out our first seven, six, seven games and win, including a win over Amity. Um, away which didn't doesn't happen very often and you don't right. need amity often in their home field and uh also we had uh you know guilford was on our schedule that year the very right. that was a tough side oh, we had, yeah. we'd yeah. played them and beat them fairly convincingly yeah um on the turf which 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 helped us at shelton um so we felt pretty good about that season and we had a little trip against cheshire a home tie against them right that was our only tie of the season but we hadn't beaten Cheshire in a while, so for us, we felt that was an accomplishment. <clears throat> um, and then we went to North Haven, middle of the season, and played this game in the rain at night. And the wheels fell off the truck that night. <laughs> right. So, yeah, we got, we got hammered. And uh, I think it was like 3-1, 4-1, something like that. And, uh, but we needed that. 
Right. Because we were getting a little bit, I think, a little that big head starting to thinking it was just going to happen. We needed to be grounded, and then we went down and we rocked a bunch of games out, won a bunch of games again. Uh, We uh, brought Amity to our house and rolled them at our house uh, that year. That's probably one of the biggest, largest margins of victory we've ever had against them. It was like 4 1. And uh, that went on pretty well. And uh, suddenly we were sitting there going to Cheshire late in the season with the S with the who's a tonic division title on the line. Right. And, uh, we go up there and we play this really, it was just a great game in Cheshire. It was one of those, a classic game. And, um, we lost it late, uh, very late in the game, um, uh, in front, you know, uh, and it was really bitter. You know, it was like our second loss. And, right. And we, it cost us the division title, you know, and so, and they were pretty disappointed, but so, you know, there was that group of girls. They just, they didn't, the, by the time they came to practice right. the next day, they were past it. They were said, let's, you know, all right, coach, let, you know, we're going to make these SCCs now. We're in the SCC tournament. Let's, let's try to win this thing. And, right. uh, and then we, we finished out the regular season and got into the postseason and, uh, yeah, we played Mercy. Uh, we had to play them away because they had a higher seed, and we beat right. them away uh, yeah. on a goal late in the game. Uh, wow. That was a pretty big. Yeah, it was a pretty big win for us. Um, we played against Brantford in the quarterfinals, and uh, we beat them pretty handily. Um, and Brantford had an up and coming kid who was going to do something to us a couple of years later. She's a, a great all stater on the way up. But right. that day, we we held them pretty well. And uh, we got to uh, Cheshire in the semis. Right. And that was the, uh, the big game. And, um, and fortunately for us, that was uh, played on our turf because we were the higher seed. Despite right. Despite the fact that they had won the division. It's the way they, the seeding were. And we, we beat them at home. And uh, then got to go play uh, Hamden for the, fight, for the title. And, right. Uh, it was another tough game. They're all a bunch of one-zero games, and uh, we beat Hamden one-zero. And uh, you know, the picture hangs in, on the desk in front of my computer. Right. Uh, it hangs on the wall above my desk on the computer now, and it's just uh, a great feeling. It was right. just wow, you know. And uh, and to be honest with you, just playing states at that point was was just glad. You know, I don't know if we'd really grasped in our mind that we could go on and win it. Right. And, um, winning the SEC was a, a big deal for us. It was uh, for some of those girls, uh, especially my seniors, uh, it, was, um, it was a big deal because they, you know, they'd, right. they'd beaten programs they'd historically been losing to for the last three years. And you know, for me, it always comes back to my emotions tied to how the players are. They, it was a big year. It was a big, huge thing for them. And, uh, and then we got, we went into States and, Right. And States was great. And, I mean, talk about talk about the States. I mean, number one, I you're into the game. You're coaching so much that you probably can't always pay attention to the clock. You got to pay attention to the game. But was there a point where there were, say, five minutes left in the game, and you looked at it and you said, God, could we just get through these five minutes? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, we we – our, we had a great postseason run with counting the SCC, the four SCC games, or the three SCC games and then the four double L games. We won seven in a row. Right. And we, went, we were unscored on in six of those seven games. That's one of the things to me is one of the best accomplishments of that right. program is they ran six of seven postseason games. They, ran, they shut out the opponents. Right. I'm a guy who builds from the back. I believe you can't lose. My, one of my central philosophies: you can't lose a game if you can't be scored on. Right. And so I try to build my teams always from the back. And we just had some girls that just played defense like monsters. Right. And um, and they did. And to me, that was a huge thing because we we just needed one or two goals, and that's what I knew if we could get those, I felt confident we could win we the could, game. We could. We could. Right. We, hit, we were in, be in a position to win the game. And um, and we did. We beat. We went to Bristol Central, played them away, uh, first round, and beat them pretty handily. Right. Um, then we went to Richfield. Uh, Not the easy. Year before, yeah. uh, Tiger. 
No, actually, Richfield uh, came to us the year before we had right. played down in Tiger Hollow, and uh, in two thousand nine, and I thought we had a shot at those guys, and you know, got a little lesson on you know intensity that day. Right. Um, but I think we you know we learned a lot from that, and uh, so we beat them at home. Uh, then we had to play Fairfield Ludlow in the uh, semifinal right. uh, at, at a neutral site. And um, they scored twice late, made the game a little close. But we had actually won. Uh, I thought we still felt that game was pretty much in hand. And I thought I didn't feel uncomfortable. Then we ended up having to play West Hill, our third FCAC team in a row. Right. And uh, they were the defending double L champs. Yeah, not an easy and, task. You know, we were... Nobody, we'd come out of nowhere. Nobody knew who, you know, Shelton never been there this far before. And um, it was, that was a game that, you know, I, I just, it was my watch the field, watch the clock, watch the field, right. watch the clock. I just couldn't, you know, because once we scored the, the go-ahead goal, which was off a free kick early in the second half, yeah, you know, it was just, can we... Can we hold it? Yeah. Well, and can we keep sustain an attack, you know, because I didn't yeah. want to hunk, bunker down and, and try to to let them come at us because they were so talented and so strong. Right. Um, but I think giving up the goal on, had rattled them. Right. They, they, they'd been really dominating the game up to that point. And from that point forward, um, we played them pretty square up. And the last three minutes of that game, I mean, I, I watched it just the other day, again, because I knew I was going to sit here and talk to you. I, I, we had to come up with three... It's really strong defensive, great defensive place. Right. And to hold them out. And I give credit to the players for who each one of them is like a moment where a player had to stand up and right. deliver a quality moment in play for us. And they did. And, um, you know, Mary Hunter, uh, who right. was one of our great central player. defenders there. Yeah. Uh, she's off at Notre Dame now, not playing soccer, but, you know, just, uh, Great kid, right? Great play, uh, you know. And they had a breakaway, that that was it. I thought for sure I was standing there when in just like aghast at watching this kid break in. I thought she was gonna go one on one against my keeper, and Brittany Brannon, who was the defender on the opposite side of the field, had tracked forty yards across the field at a dead sprint and literally picked the ball off the girl's foot and took it up the field. And that was like with wow. 30 seconds oh, left in the game man. on a 1v1. And then they still had a great shot with like five or six seconds left in the game. They fired a rocket right at Melissa Briette, who was our keeper. Um, and uh, Melissa snatched that ball down. And I still remember so clearly she snatched that ball down, looked up at the clock and saw it was under five seconds. And that ball went in the air and never left her hands. I think we had to rip it out of her hands later because right. uh, she wasn't going to give that ball up. And we were the champs. And and describe that feeling. Like when you saw zero on the clock, you know, zero time on the clock and you knew you won. And after all, because, you know, there were some losing years at Derby. It was tough. You know, you finally get, you climb that mountain because you said yourself, you wanted to see what kind of coach you could be. And this is a program that had never won a state title in soccer. Just talk about what you felt like. I mean, were you able to even walk after that game? Well, you know, I, I think the best, you really want to know what I was like. You should ever look at the game film and look at the post-game interview where the, uh, the fellow from the uh, Connecticut Sports Network there has got the mic shoved in my face, and he's speaking to this fellow who's clearly catatonic and can't right. <laughs> form a sentence and blah, 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 blah. And that was me. I just didn't, couldn't think at all. Right. It just, uh, it was just amazing. It was like, you're standing apart watching it, you know, and, right. and uh, watching the kids celebrate. And um, there's a picture that somebody took of my t two co Jim Farrow and John Ashcroft, my JV coach, and my varsity assistant coach who were with me on that sideline. Right. Were, were integral parts of that championship. Don't ever, you know, the coaching team is just as important as the playing team. Right. And uh, huge contributors. We're all in some kind of group hug. I don't even remember that. You know? Right. And, uh, then uh, and of course the players are dogpiling in the middle of the field and yeah and it's just uh, it didn't really start hitting me until we were on the bus ride home and we got turned on to Route Eight and, and the Shelton police were waiting right. on the side of the Route Eight for us 
and that had to be an awesome feeling. It was the the kids were amazed. Um, I was amazed that you know we'd had this huge crowd at the game. You know, you, huge crowd of people that come from Shelton to the game. Biggest crowd that we'd ever played in front of since I'd been there. Right. And uh, you know, there were people in cars honking, uh, going through the town. Right. You know, like the bus ride driver took an extra weird route to get us through town. I'm sure people said, "What's going on out there?" But um, you still, that's when I started getting a sense of that we'd really accomplished something. And, right. You know, I, it didn't, you know, be honest with you, for me personally, it took a few days before I really started taking personalizing that, wow. Right. You know, I was able to look at, I've been a part of this and I helped make this happen. And right. That was, you know, you get that sense of accomplishment at work and stuff like that. And I've done that over the years and always been proud of projects and things. But something about when you do it with sports. You yeah, know, there's it's this a... emotional thing that comes out of you, and that was. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the first thought is, "Well, let's do it again." Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then people... that was so good. Let's 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 go for that feeling again. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. I mean, how proud are you? Number, I'll ask you two questions. One, when you see former players, say you run into them at the store or wherever, or you just like maybe see them drive by, do you kind of always smile? Like when you see them and say, wow, look what, you know, I, I was able to accomplish with them. And number two, how, how proud are you to wear that ring? Oh, I have it on my finger right now. Right. Um, and everybody who knows me knows I wear it all the time because I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of what we've done, not just for myself. I'm proud of being part of this great program I'm at at Shelton High. Right. Um, I get it kind of emotional, but I can't whack go on about how great it is to be with these people. Right. They're just superb people who um, want you to be successful. Right. Do what they have to to make you successful. The players, the, the parents, the uh, Shelton soccer community, the athletic director, the school, the faculty, the office, it doesn't matter. You know, everybody, they're, you know, they know that for a lot of them it's their job, but they don't do it like it's their job. They do it because they care. And that's that's the great part for me. The uh, um, sense of that's where all that pride comes from. And uh, and I know it's this actually the second part of your question. Um, and I wear that ring to remind our players, right. the new players who haven't felt this, that this is what can be accomplished right. when you have a bunch of people who really don't care who gets the credit. And you have a bunch of people who care about putting the the team in front of their own personal ego. Right, right. Um, the things that we all get, the values we get taught when we were young in sports. You know, when you really embody those and, and then you do the hard work that's necessary, this is what you can accomplish. And you have to remind me of the first part of your question again. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, When you see, like, former players, oh, okay, I mean, yeah. do you smile every time you see them just thinking what but, you, you know, were when able you're, to? When you're the coach and you've been spending years – off and on cajoling him and barking at him and poking at him and laughing with him, you know, as well and joking around with him. And, um, but there's this, you, you know, you can be friendly, but it's tough to be friends because you have to be there in charge. And, right. you know, as much as you like her, you might have to get after her for something that she's not doing in the game or that she's not working in practice. Or And so... That's always hard because you've got to keep that little gap. Right. Um, what I like now is when I see my former players, is the gap's not there. Right. And um, I don't just say hi to them. Most of the time we give a hug because right. uh, it's just we know how hard what we did together and how hard we worked. And even the, kid, the years where we didn't accomplish a lot, you know, we didn't. You Those know, we kids just all played a part, oh, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're great kids. I mean, I mean, I, and, you know, I. For me, at this point, as older as, as I get older, I kind of look at them all now as kind of like an extension of my daughters. They're, you know, they, so many of these girls are, you know, I, my, my own daughters are in their 30s now. And, and, uh, and I see these players now, they're in their 30s and their 20s and you know, right. in their teens. And it's just like uh, they have their own kids. You know, I have a former player at Derby who I believe is coaching somewhere at one of the tech schools now. Oh, wow. And, yeah, coaching yeah. soccer. And, uh, and I, I know I have a former, and I have another former player who, uh, my first year at Derby, who's coaching up at, the, I think, up at Pomperog now. And she's oh, up there nice. coaching up there. Right. Um, 
these people may have coached anyway, but it just feels like you feel a connection to that. And um, that's one of the best things is because when they're adults, it's, you see them how they've grown up. You knew when they were 13 and 14, and now you see them when they're 24. And, right. And all the things you knew they were within them, you see that what they've accomplished with that. And you like to think that you had just a little bit of, a little bit of help to right. whatever they've become. You know? right. right. Um, before I talk about this year's team, you talked about, you know, wanting to do it again. And I know that's a goal to try to win a second one. You were fortunate enough to win another SCC. Um, I believe, was it 2015 you won right. the SCC? Right. We actually played in three SCC championships in a row. We won the 2010. Yeah. And we lost the uh, 2011 final to Cheshire. Right. Um, won nothing. And then we lost the 2012 final. Uh, to uh, Brantford, right? Uh, I mentioned that player earlier who was, yeah. uh, uh, she was a, a real house wrecker. She was a great player. And um, we lost to them in overtime. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. We, we gave up a penalty kick in overtime. Uh, it, it, was, it was a deserved call. I don't ever like the referees. We deserved the penalty. Um, it's the only time that girl got away from us the whole game. And uh, so we lost that, and that was tough. Uh, and then we kind of had a, little dip the 2013 but we built back up in 14 and so 15 we thought we and we we did win the division in 11 too for the first right. time we yeah. won the division 11 and then we uh came back in 15 and uh end up playing uh laurelton hall in the final there and that game right. went to uh penalty kicks and uh extra kick and right penalty kicks to determine a winner and our goalkeeper shelby offered uh who was now playing up at keen state um came up with two Big saves right. in, the, in, in the penalty kick shootout. And uh, Sarah Skaronsky, uh, no yeah. one of our players, a uh, fine player who just graduated last year, um, she hits the uh, winning PK. And it was a great night because the boys had just, the boys, Shelton boys had just won the SCC two hours earlier right. on the same field. Uh, I think they played West Haven. And so we'd watch them win. And, and now they you watched guys, us win, yeah. and it was like a, a Shelton love fest, right? <laughs> for soccer love fest that on, on the at the Fields right, at East right. Haven that night, and it was a, it was a nice championship. Um, I felt really proud of the girls, and uh, yeah, we had some interesting things. The year after we won states, we only we got knocked out of uh, states the next year by uh, Staples, right. but we went took twenty nine penalty kicks. Yeah, some weird things have happened over the years, and that was right. those are the things that kind of stick in my mind about the seasons. Those little weird things like the twenty nine penalty kicks the next year. Right, I really thought that was quite an accomplishment. <laughs> that you know, it took us that long, one of us to beat each other. So we won back there in fifteen, and uh, last year we uh, we didn't go as far. Right, um, but uh, I, you know, we. I think we're in, we're tracking pretty well for this year. And so. talk about this year's team a little bit, because um, you have a lot of you have seniors on this team that have kind of played for you since their sophomore year, correct? I mean, right, right. right. So right. talk about the seniors. I mean, I know Kelly Hurd's a very good player. Um, right. You know, she's been playing youth soccer too at the club since she was a little kid. Right. So talk about the seniors on this squad. Well, it's I have eight seniors, a great group of girls. Um, our captains are Courtney Litz and. Uh, Allison Panic, Sal, right. as we call her, Sal. Um, Courtney plays our, is our goalkeeper, and uh, Sal is our uh, one of our defenders. And um, good, good captains, done a good job. Um, they uh, have a vision about what they wanted to accomplish. We started talking about that in March and April together as we went through some leadership sessions, and uh, we were um, kind of formed the vision for this year. Uh, and the rest of the senior class, Kelly Hurd, uh, Rebecca Cliff, yeah, uh, another great, another great kid, um, Sean Reinhardt. Who, right. Sean, you're still the coolest player in the program. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, them, uh, Tori Searles. Uh, I'm trying to make sure I don't forget all their names because kind of caught me off guard with the, with this class. Um, that whole group of seniors, right? Uh, are they're good? Liz Hurley, uh, all doing a great job this year, right? Um, they're getting uh, they're good leaders on the field. Uh, they work hard in training. It's one of the things I like about this team this year is it's not a team I have to get after to train properly. They right. really they kind of just they, do it. They, yeah. they get it. 
And so they get out there, they, you know, they're, they're diligent and they're hardworking and, uh, you know, there's not a lot of distraction. And, um, and I think as they starting, they're starting to really see that they could be a team that leaves a legacy here right. uh, program this year. And, and we have a, there's a close relationship between the seniors and the juniors. We have a lot of juniors. Uh, our, our varsity this year is principally the seniors and juniors. Right. And uh, we're carrying three sophomores um, on that vars- JV on the varsity this year. And uh, they're all um, – you can start to see it in their eyes. And that's to me, that's an important thing is that they, the belief is starting to really, to really understand that they can accomplish some things. And so we set some goals this year. You know, we set off uh, – you know, well, well, the first goal we set, we wanted to uh, – Sweep Amity. <laughs> that right. didn't work too well this year. <laughs> We've got two losses, and I won't get, you can guess who they both are. Right. They've been both been great games. I mean, right. uh, Owen Quigley over at Amity, got, I got tons of respect for him and his program, and I think he has the same for ours. Um, we measure ourselves against them every year. Right. And, uh, we're looking forward to seeing them in the SCCs. Um, right. And then we have a uh, – so that one went out the window. And, but, you know, we still – we want to win the division again this year. We wanted to get the SEC championship game, and we think we're on track to that. Uh, we right. think we're on a good track. We're going to finish in, in the top eight, and we're going to have a shot for that. And, right. Uh, I believe this is a good side this year. They're, um, they're great kids. I'm really proud of them. Right. And uh, we're 6-2-1, and one, and we've got uh, seven games to go in the regular season, and you know we, we can lock in states with another win, and uh, – I'm sure we'll get that win, you know, in the second half of the season. So, um, but we're going to right. shoot for that division title and then shoot for that conference title. Don't want to think too far ahead. We want right. to think first about that division title. That's gets us through the regular season and gets us in right. good shape for seeding for states and for SCCs. Plus we have a tough non-conference game with Joel Barlow coming up this year. Oh, okay. That's another, right. You know, they're a good side too for the FCX. So. Right. So let me ask you this. You've been coaching between Derby and Shelton as a head coach over 20 years now. I mean, in five years from now, do you still plan on coaching? I mean, have you hit that wall yet where you say, you know what, I'm burned out or is it still fun? Well, I don't for think you? I'm burned out. I don't know if I can get burned out. I don't my My family says if, if he didn't have soccer, what would he do? You know, with himself. Um, right. I don't think it's that bad. Um, I don't think I'm obsessed, um, compelled maybe, but not obsessed. The, um, at this point, I'm at a point, you know, you get older, you get, start getting some perspective, and you, gotta, you, know, and you, you can't do the things you used to be able to do. Right. Um, so for me, it's all now a year-to-year thing. I, every year I look at it and ask myself, do I have another year? Because I know if I, this requires you to give, to do this right, it required to give 100% to, your, to the effort. And, right. uh, and if you can't give that, then you're cheating the kids. Right. And, and I won't cheat the kids. So as long as I feel I can give them 100%, that I can help them grow as players, um, that I can earn their respect, right. um, that, uh, then I'm going to probably stick around. And, you know, make sure I have good assistant coaches, keep some young ones right. around who can still run with them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and fortunately, I do. I have a great assistant coaching staff at this year. I've got, you know, that's Joe Gill, who, right. uh, who's been with me and been around for many years. Um, and uh, Stephen Bell, um, English fellow who uh, works with the, the youth soccer program in town, direct, director of coaching, my JV coach, and a fellow, Jose Sendra, who teaches up in the Nogatuck system, uh, right. but who's our, uh, our freshman coach. And uh, they're great people, and that helps a lot. Right. With, with, with the staff and the uh, and keeping me motivated to come back every year. I just like working with these guys. We have a very collaborative relationship. That's a big part of the fulfillment, too. Right. Is that you work with people. That peers, you enjoy. Right. That you enjoy working with. You know, my friend Mr. Ashcroft always, well, Mr. Harris, the uh, original coach at uh, Derby Boys, told me that it's, it always ends this way for high school coaches. He says, you know, you retire. You get fired, or you become beloved. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and he says, once you become beloved, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose anymore because you're beloved. Right. And um, I don't think I'm beloved. I'm not sure I'll ever get to that level. Uh, but I don't feel I'm going retired, and I think my performance is pretty good, and so Mr. Nissi's going to keep me around another year, I hope. And, uh, 
And as long as I think it works that way, I'm going to stick around. You know, I love right. it at Shelton, and as long as the people at Shelton think I can help, then I think it's a great marriage for us. Right. So one final question before we wrap it up. What has been, I'm sure winning the state title is definitely rewarding, but just as someone who's run soccer leagues, been a head coach, what's been the most rewarding thing for you personally? Well, it, for me, it always comes back to the kids. Um, it keeps me young. Right. You know? I mean, we, you know, these are cliches, but they're true. They, they're true cliches. It, it, it keeps me young. I, I love being around the kids, whether they're the four-year-olds and down in the academy at the, at the boys club league or whether they're the 17-year-olds that are uh, sitting on a soccer field um, with me. Right. You know, it's, I, I coach a, a club team that's 2005 girls, you know, that middle of that seventh grade group of girls. Right. And there's just, you know, what makes me come to the field every day is knowing for the next hour and a half, I'm going to work and work with these kids who are trying so hard to be the best that they can be at something and uh, are fun and they're entertaining and right. they laugh and, you know, you, you can yell at them and you walk away two minutes later and they're laughing about something else. And, right. and it's, uh, to me, that's seeing the kids accomplish things. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it any other way than just I, I, you kind of get a you know, feed off their joy, you know, right. feed off their off their happiness, off of this, and it, and it's it's intoxicating. You know, it is. It for me, that's that's what keeps me coming back every year. Well, coach, this has been a great honor. It's been a great interview, and I really do admire what you've done for the program, not just the. Shelton program, but to me, that youth soccer program that you do year in and year out is one of the greatest things for kids, and it's an unbelievable program, and the job you do with that is what stands out to me the most, and I really do applaud you on everything you've done for youth soccer and, you know, high school soccer in general, and I really want to thank you for coming on today. Well, I appreciate you asking me. Um, just a little plug, registration start for the Boys Club League in the <laughs> couple of weeks um but uh again i'm just one there's a lot of great people that make this sport work in the valley and i'm just one of them and uh i'm honored to be part of it and i thank you very much for letting me share what a little bit of experience i have with it with you well thank you again i really do appreciate it and that was shelton girls soccer coach marvin miller for valley sports rewind i'm mike canici saying goodbye everyone mm-hmm.